Arusha's making Parmesan, Benchies that are a little bit squished and feeling under pressure, and some support issues. All this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 89. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And if you're new here and you're dealing with some printer failures, leave a like and get subscribed. And if these fixes don't help you with your specific issues, you can reach out to us directly by emailing us YouTube at 3dmusketeers.com or hitting us up on all the social medias. Links are on the screen and in that description down below. Twitter is generally one of the better social medias to get my personal attention as well as email. So you wanna get some help, that's how you do it. And for those of you that have emailed us, Thank you. Remember, we are accepting fan submissions. So if you are looking to have me take a look at your fails on the show, make sure to submit them, tag us in the posts, and hey, send it to me via email as well. So I do my best not to forget about it. Anyways, we got a lot of great fails and fixes for them today, but let's start off with one that might make you a little bit hungry or a little bit grossed out. We got a Prusa here making some, well, not spaghetti, more of Parmesan, you'll see. Starting off with an interesting Prusa failure, we've got Adam here who says he thinks he's found the source of the spaghetti, and I think, no, you've actually found the source of the grated Parmesan. We've got ourselves a Prusa here, and we can see into the extruder with one of the Bontech gears being open. So the extruder door has been opened, and we can see into it, and there is a ton of shaving of filament that is in there. And there are quite a few causes for this that could be. Not all of them are the exact answer because it's kind of difficult here. The first thing I would look at is, is your extruder tension enough? The fact that it's open tells me obviously not right now, but is it good overall? You might have too low of extruder tension and that might cause it to start to grind filament a little bit. And once those hobbed gears do get a little bit caked up or they get a little bit of stuff in there, it is very easy for them to continue that process of shaving off just a little bit of filament. This can also be caused from excess back pressure and gunk inside of the hot end on a Prusa. Prusas use a E3DV6, and it does have a little piece of PTFE coming out of the top traditionally. Now that PTFE does not go down into the block, so this is still an all metal hot end, PTFE just helps guide things through. If that PTFE is damaged and creating too much friction as the filament is going through, that extra back pressure could cause the same issue that we're seeing here. It could also be from the nozzle itself being clogged. If you got a partial clog in your nozzle, that extra backlash could cause the extruder to skip. But that all comes back to not having enough extruder pressure. We run enough extruder pressure on our Prusas so that if they do start to have a problem, the stepper motor will start to skip. And that is an audible noise that we can pick up rather than something that we have to look for, which like, you know, the shavings of Parmesan are going to be a little bit difficult to uh, find if you're not really looking for them. So you're going to want to take this thing apart. To clean it, you're going to want to pull the extruder apart, pull those gears out, and completely clean them. We recommend a toothbrush, generally, or a fine wire brush to get each of those little pieces of the teeth cleaned. You can use a pick of sorts, like a metal pick is great for digging out any plastic that is stuck inside of the hob gear, but that will be necessary to bring this printer back to life. Now, you could just send it to increase your extruder pressure and hope that it cleans itself, but honestly, it's not that much more effort to pull the extruder apart, so I wouldn't worry about it. I think it's four screws to pull the entire hot end out and extruder apart on a Prusa. It might be six. It's not very many, suffice to say. And if you have to ask yourself, when was the last time you checked your hob gears? It's been too long. Go ahead and check them and make sure they're okay if you do use a Prusa because the screw can back out. You might have too little pressure. And this is a common thing that can happen if you don't check in on it. This user was likely dealing with quite a bit of under extrusion in the entire process, and I'd be curious to see if any of the fixes would solve their issue. For me, I know it does, but each printer is a little bit different. And if those hob gears don't line up properly, because it is a dual drive, one gear drives the other, then it can cause some issues in your filament feeding as well. But I would hedge my bet that is either extruder pressure or the PTFE, because the PTFE does wear out on the hot end side. So good to do. And with the vertical 5015, it leads me to believe this might be an original Mark III. If that's the case, while you're at it, if you're going to pull the whole thing apart, if you got another printer, you might want to look at printing the MK3S Plus upgrade, which will give you a better filament path and a little bit easier use for TPU and that kind of materials. So the softer materials, MK3S handles quite a bit better. Hope it helps. Dot zip benchy, I guess. And if you don't get the joke, it's compressed. So we have a Benchy here that is just 
a little compressed in the Z. We can see here, this is a Prusa i3 MK1 old school, assuming this is an actual Prusa, not some sort of a clone, but it suddenly started printing wrong Z heights. They will tighten the belts, remove the XY wobble, and will also try to clean the threads on the ZX, but they don't know what else to do. Thank you to everyone who helps me here. Yeah, sad Benchy is sad. It is not just squish. It looks like it's elongated as well. It looks like one of these, like, you know, someone non-uniform scaled it in like Photoshop. Everything here just isn't the size that you expect it to be in any of the axes that we're expecting it to be. And if this is an OG Gen 1 MK1, it is potentially time to look at changing out the machine. Yes, you can make these fixes. And one of the big ones is going to be to make sure that you don't have any binding in the Z axis. Since a lot of the damage we can see here is in a shortened Z axis, you want to make sure you don't have any binding. The other thing you want to check is to make sure that your steps per millimeter are set correctly. If you had something go awry in the motherboard and it somehow reset at steps per millimeter. I don't know how this could happen, but with an older machine, it's not unreasonable to assume that it could happen. You will want to make sure that your steps per millimeter are set correctly. Traditionally, it's at least 400 in the Z, but you will have to measure it yourself. It's a pretty easy thing to do with a pair of calipers. You send the printer up 100 millimeters and you measure to see how far it actually moved. If it moved less or more, you have to make some adjustments. And in this case, I'm guessing it's going to move a lot less than 100 millimeters. In fact, I'm guessing a lot closer to 50. This Benchy looks to be about half the height that I'm expecting it to be. Looking forward at other issues here, we've got some issues with stringing and retraction, but I don't want to get too deep into those. I believe the biggest issue to be dealing with right now is that Z axis. Now there might be some issues on the Y axis as well, but I can't easily tell. So what else can we do here? I will check to make sure your Z axis is not binding. If it's not binding, then it's definitely a steps per millimeter thing. You want to look to make sure that the wiring on the stepper motors is also intact. With machines this old, you could have some problems. Remember the MK1 is quite old. I mean, the MK3 lasted five years. So the MK2 and the MK1 quite a bit ago, and it might be time to look at upgrading. There are so many better and newer printers on the market. And while the MK1 is still going to work fine, it is certainly falling very behind. When it comes to print quality, ease of use, and just generalized reliability. But I will say, I'm impressed. Let's start with the Z axis and then let's move on to the others. Once you get the Z axis figured out, I would check to see if any of these issues here are going to be from issues with the filament itself. Maybe not enough retraction or too much. In this case, it looks like it is not enough retraction and specifically maybe having too much extra restart distance. Knowing things like the slicer and other settings that were used would be helpful here, but we don't have them, unfortunately. So I would start with mechanical, then work my way to software because mechanical, in my opinion, is a lot easier to solve. Replacing parts is easier than having to go through and send G code commands and everything like that through programs like Pronterface. Next up, a fail from our Patreon Discord from a member named Sunday who has an issue with their SV06. They're running a pretty much stock machine with the one upgrade that we do recommend on the SV06, which is a Diamondback nozzle, who also happen to be the sponsors of this video. If you would like to get some of the best nozzles out there, quite literally tipped in diamonds, reach out to the guys at Diamondback. We have links to them in the description down below with a coupon code that will help you save a couple of bucks when you go do decide to make your purchase. Being tipped in diamond means that not only do your top layers get auto ironed, but you can feed whatever you want through this nozzle. And as long as it doesn't clog, she's gonna run just fine. And unlike your hardened steel nozzles, you lower your temperature rather than raise it, which we're going to see technically one of the problems that we're dealing with here. But carrying a factory warranty made in America America, with some of the most amazing technology available, the Diamondback nozzles are quite literally one of the last nozzles that you will ever need. We run them on quite a few of our printers and we'll be converting all of our V6 printers over to Diamondbacks here very soon. So make sure you get subscribed if you want to see that process because 
uh, it's gonna take a while. But we are excited to have Diamondback as a sponsor of the channel because they do make an amazing product. You can go back and look at my reviews of their products. It is pretty amazing. And that was even before they knew that I existed. So when the opportunity came, we knew we had to jump on it. We have run well over 20 kilograms of carbon fiber through one of our 0.6 Diamondbacks on the Prusa behind me that is signed and it's still works just fine with whatever we want to throw at it. And that's a testament to the quality of the polycrystalline diamond structure that the nozzle tip is made out of. Having better thermal conductivity, better hardness, and just all around ease of use compared to things like hardened steel nozzles. The Diamondback nozzle is an amazing option if you are looking to go the hardened route to use something like carbon fiber or glass fiber filled materials. And well, never have to change it back if you want to run something like PLA. But remember, you lower your temps, not increase them, which is always the odd thing about it. But if you do want to get yourself a Diamondback nozzle available in quite a few different sizes, as well as for different types of machines, you can click the links in that description down below or in the pinned comment, get yourself a good quality nozzle made in America at a really reasonable price. But let's get back to helping out Sundy here, who does definitely have the right nozzle. That's probably where the good things come to an end. They are running PLA 850 with the 210 60 settings. So that's 210 on the hot end, 60 on the bed. 210 for PLA with a diamond back is way too hot. In fact, you normally want to be in like 190 range. We've ran lower than the Prusas will let us run and still had pretty decent layer adhesion because of thermal conductivity. It matters that much. While they are using the stock build plate, they are looking at getting the wham bam smooth plate. What we can see is that we had some parts shifting as well as a part that appeared to just get knocked off the build plate or the first couple of layers got knocked off as well. We asked to check to make sure that the Y axis belt or X axis belt, depending on which way the shift occurred, was not loose, that the grub screw wasn't loose or anything like that. Barring those issues, I am personally not a huge fan of textured build plates and I find that sometimes PLA doesn't like to stick. Why? I don't know. It just gets upset and says, I'm not going to stick anymore. That's why we like to run smooth build plates. Now on the SV06 and the SV06 Plus, which by the way, both of those are getting upgrades very soon, of course, with Diamondback nozzles, but also some other features. Stay tuned and get subscribed. That's something that you guys would like to see. It's coming soon. But when you deal with a textured build plate, you do want to make sure it is very, very clean. Because if it's not thin contact patches like this, this thing is basically a bunch of concentric circles. If only a couple of them come loose, it can create a nightmare for the printer where the head is knocking into things. And it's not the fault of the printer. It's not the fault of the nozzles. It's just the fault of bad bed adhesion. So I said, if it is not a mechanical thing, let's get that build plate off the printer, get it cleaned off with soap and water, wipe it down with alcohol, and rerun your first layer calibration on the machine to make sure that you're getting a good squish into that first layer for the textured build plates. As we talked about in a previous video all about Z offset, which we'll card to, so you guys can take a look. With the textured build plates, you want to have more squish than you would with a smooth sheet. This enables the bits of plastic to really grip that textured build plate versus the smooth ones where it just kind of grips it without any issues. And while I do like the textured look on the bottom of prints, if you are gonna be building multiple part models, that textured surface can be a pain when it comes to gluing. So keep that in mind. That can be a bit of a trap for those that do want to build like cosplay parts, but do seamless integration of pieces. The irregularity of the textured build plate can make those parts have more of a gap and a seam than what you would expect with something like a smooth plate. So after redoing the slicer settings from the ground up, clean the bed, everything stuck just fine. It looked better all the way through the print, to be honest, as Sundy said. They lowered the temp to 200, but they are getting a nice shiny finish on the fan side and a dull mat on the leeward side, which is an interesting thing because you would think that if the part has less cooling, it would look shinier, but in this particular case, that's not right. Now you could look at just putting better cooling on it. And we do recommend like a 5015 fan duct. That is one of the upgrades we're gonna be doing on our SV06. You can also just look at printing a little bit slower if that is an issue, but 200 might still be too hot. Remember the Diamondbacks really push a lot of heat through. 
so you can run a lot colder than you think you might need to. In this case, I would say, let's go back to basics. Let's run a temp tower and see where the material performs the best. Being PLA, it's probably going to be just fine somewhere between 210 and 180 because it's PLA. It's really not that picky. But if it's okay all the way to 180, then run 180. We normally say run as cold as you possibly can, unless you are really pushing for layer adhesion. If you need a part that's structural, we tell people deliberately over temp the material. So instead of running PETG at 245, run it at 260. You'll get better layer adhesion. And sure, it might result in a little bit more cleanup, but a stronger part to me is worth those couple of extra minutes on the cleanup side every day of the week. Next up, one from our editor, Andrew, Hiya. who built a cup holder expansion for his car. Pretty certain that's what this is. And Andrew, I guess, has not done too many things regarding support material. And he was wondering why the heck the bottom of his parts look so bad. And in this case, Andrew, it is because you ripped the bottom layer off. And when we look over here, that ain't bad for a bone stock SV06. I take that all the way to the bank. That looks great to me. Now, what we do see are the actual infill lines not connecting with the perimeters all that well. And in this particular case, you would look at increasing your infill overlap percentage. So that infill comes a little bit further over and will hopefully connect with those perimeters. That is how you get some of that internal strength strength. But of course, as we know, strength comes from perimeters, not too much from infill itself. We can see on areas where it was a very, you know, just single line surface rather than something like this, where it has to also connect into a circle. The bridge looks pretty darn good and probably actually didn't need any support if any was added there to begin with. But yeah, this is a case of really needing to tune those settings, and this will take some time. We often tell people you need to look at orienting your model in a way, even if it does take longer to print, you don't have to see any of the rough surfaces. And being that this is the top surface that Andrew is going to see, there's not too much he can do. Now, you could go the route of playing a really cool game with Prusa Slicer and basically cutting this model right at this edge and about 0.4 millimeter down, two layers thick print it, you cut off the part that looks like crap and you glue it on top. Now for client parts or things like that, I never recommend you do this, but if they're for your own parts and you just want the top of it to look a little bit pretty and you didn't orient the part the right way for printing, it's a pretty easy fix to do. And while it's completely cosmetic and will provide basically zero structural stability, if all you're going for is cosmetic, then who the heck cares? But Andrew here is living on the wild side because this is black PLA that is supposed to go in his car in Florida. I give it about two weeks before it starts to look like it needs a bit of the blue pill help if you know what I'm saying. The inside looks a little bit better, but does suffer from the same problems. We can actually see that the perimeters are pulling away from where they should be. That is always due to a cooling thing. If you're not giving the material enough cooling, it's gonna start to shrink as it slowly cools. The idea of cooling it fast is that you don't give the material enough time to shrink at all and you lock it in place as quickly as you can. That is why we recommend on some printers that upgrading the fan to a better fan system System makes for better printing overall. And in this case, it might be time for Andrew to do that or slow this machine down a little bit. I swear sometimes our Patreon members find the weirdest fails. This one is from Devoid Colossus who found in the wild a hot end that looks like this. So one, time to change that nozzle and might I recommend today's sponsor, Diamondback Nozzles, to you know, replace that with. I have a feeling you tried to loosen your nozzle when it was cold. And if that's the case, you're lucky that's all that happened because you can still heat this thing up and get it apart. Often what will happen if you try to take the nozzle off when it's cold, it will snap at the threads and you'll have to use an easy out to get everything out, like a broken bolt extractor. It's basically what you would be looking to do. Or left-handed drill bit would also work. You need to change nozzles when your printer is hot. If your printer does not have an all metal hot end, you want to look somewhere in the 230 to 245 range to heat up the nozzle too. And if you do have an all metal hot end, 290 is where we'd like to go. Additionally, people say go as high as you can but in some printers if they go above their max temp by even one degree it shuts the entire printer off so i'd rather have some headroom so that as i'm holding a wrench on it sinking some of the heat away when i pull that wrench off and the hot end which is just dumping heat into itself 
goes over what it's expecting to go over, then we can feel a little bit safe that we're not going to over temp the printer and put it into a situation where it thinks it is in thermal runaway. This particular case, this is a Mark 8 style block with no accoutrement there. We can see that it would be one of the ones that has the bolts that go up into the heat sink. We don't see a heater. We don't see a thermistor. We don't see anything. I would just take this, toss it in the trash and get a new one because with how cheap this stuff tends to be, if you can just take the pieces apart, you could even recycle the metal if you wanted to. You now would need to get a vise or reinstall this thing onto your printer and get it heated up. If you have a bench vise, we put it into the bench vise, grab yourself a ye olde blowtorch, heat the ever loving crap out of it and use some pliers to try to unscrew the nozzle because of course your threads are gone now so you're just gonna have to do it by hand and while this is a bit of a case of f it we'll do it live you got nothing to lose it's already screwed and stuck in there so you might as well just give it a shot at this point this to me is what happens with one too many uggy duggies on the actual piece itself remember hot ends are very delicate you're dealing with steel aluminum and brass all in the same area and while none of those metals should really touch each other because galvanic corrosion is kind of a thing but is not really ever an issue in this industry so i don't know we do deal with the fact that these metals shrink quite a bit especially aluminium which is what the block is made out of it shrinks quite a bit and will lock that brass nozzle into place tighter than a pair of ice grips so you're going to really have to wrench on it, likely end up breaking the nozzle if you opt to still do it when it's cold. And that's why oftentimes how cheap some of these parts are, it is just better to replace it and not deal with the BS of it in the future. And I know that's not necessarily the answer you would be looking for because that means you have to spend money. But if you don't already have the tools to extract this nozzle at this point for the basic kind of end user, this is too far gone to repair. Next up, a fail from the bamboo whisperer himself, Mr. Sam Prentice, who, while he can whisper sweet nothings to bamboo, has had some struggles with his Creality K1. He thought he was alone in the hot end, just kind of failing and starting to leak. Apparently, he's not. So we have an individual from the Creality official user group on Facebook, of course, saying, so I found the issue with my K1 since I received it last week. The hot end snapped and it's been oozing out filament from the top on all the prints, causing stringing, blobs, etc. Didn't realize this was the issue until I took it all apart. Anyone know where I can buy another? This is where open source runs away with a win and closed source starts to fail. This is a closed source hot end and I'm not certain that Creality even sells them themselves. We looked on Amazon and didn't see any ability for a replacement. And with the K1 being such a new machine, it's not surprising to me that the spare parts are going to be hard to find. In a case like this, you gotta kind of call the company and hope they've got parts they can send you, or you gotta start doing a return. That's gonna suck. But we can see some further issues. We got some wires hanging out here that look like they go to a thermistor. What's really going on here? I'm worried that there might be some issues with the K1. I don't have any contacts at Creality and I would believe that I'm probably on their naughty list, but if you guys do want to see us take a look at the K1, let me know and I will see what I can do. Something tells me they don't like me over there. It's not that I've ever been negative about Creality in the past for all the things they continually do to really piss me off and violate people's patents, copyrights, and trademarks and all the other fun things in the injury. But you know what? Hey, better to try and fail than not try at all. Am I right? But we can see similar to the bamboo. By the way, the K1 is Creality's bamboo clone. Let's not beat around the bush. It's what it is. We can see they've definitely got some extra, you know, hardware on the boards, some sort of likely microprocessor A6 sitting there and some passives as well. I don't know how I feel about that. What do you guys think of tool head boards on machines. Do you want to see some of the processing being done on the tool head of the printer? Or are you like me and would rather just have a CAN bus system that goes up that delivers the power and everything where it belongs and have all the processing being handled somewhere else? I can understand the value of running only a couple of cables up and letting the processing occur on the tool head, but I feel like all that quick movement can't be good for all those wires and maybe i'm just thinking too far into this but i like it when all my motherboards are under my machine or somewhere where they're easily accessible not on a tool head where i'm definitely going to burn myself if i burn myself on a live stream which we did on the recent anchor make one that we did i'll guarantee burn myself trying to fix something here
So I don't know. Love to know your thoughts and opinions there as well. Finally, a fail from Patreon member Logan Luckless, who has a rat rig with some problems. We got some ringing here. They're having an issue with input shaper. They upgraded to a carbon fiber x-axis which works great except the linear rails they got for the x-axis are kind of messed up the entire tool head rocks back and forth about three full millimeters that's a lot for you yanks that's about an eighth of an inch and for you guys uh, that's about three inches naturally this messed up the input shaping results and caused the monstrosity that you see here thankfully they found one place that has MGN9H rails long enough from LDO. So this rat rig went through some upgrades that weren't exactly upgrades, but are now upgrades because they had some failed parts. That is how life goes sometimes. That is a really interesting issue with Input Shaper and reminds me of the bamboo failure that I had last week, where I believe that I had a bad measurement of either Input Shaping or the LiDAR sensor. We'll record to that episode so you guys can take a look because I'm still mad about this bamboo failure. But thankfully with a new part, everything was good to go and well, that's what you need sometimes. You really can't fix bad bearings. When they're gone, they're gone. There's not much that can be done about it. And it sucks and it is expensive because decent quality MGN 9H rails are not cheap. But you know, if you're willing to take some risks, you can get them from the usual suspects relatively cheap. Now, getting them from LDO means you're gonna get a good quality and stay tuned because there is an LDO sponsored Voron Trident 300 kit that we're going to be unboxing and assembling all on live stream. So if you want to watch me ride the struggle bus, stay tuned because that is coming down the pipes in the next couple of months. But that's all I have for you guys today. Let me know down in those comments what you thought about these failures and my fixes for them. But stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. Don't forget to leave a like. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one. I think we're okay for now. Oh, what a big yawn. She's very tired. It's very tough being this cat. She has to yawn. It's how she reminds you that she's always working. Ever vigilant, always busy. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. And a massive thank you goes out to all of our Patreon, YouTube, and PayPal supporters, whose names listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Remember, if you do want to get behind the scenes content, come hang out with myself and the other Musketeers. You can do so by clicking those links in that description down below. And while you're down there, don't forget to click the links for Diamondback. Check out their offerings and hey, pick yourself up a nozzle. <laughs> They're worth it. Honestly, I said that even before they sponsored the channel. Right below me will be the entire Print Fix Friday series, where you can take a look at some other fails and how we fixed them. And next to that will be an entirely random video that the YouTube algorithm thinks that you should click. I think you should click them both. And then click into those comments because that's where I will see you and I will see you in the next one. Take care.